All right, so we've got to the working of our meeting where we can just talk. Um, so, if, you know, I want this to be an opportunity for folks to be able to say something that they haven't been able to earlier, um, have any follow-up questions for presenters. Um, and I want to make sure that people on Zoom can, you know, uh, have a discussion as well. So, um, you know, want this to be open and democratic if you have uh, questions about something or anything, you know, anything you want to speak about, uh, whether it's related to KBUM, to uh, you know, dam removal, to water quality, to anything that you're working on that has relevance to our group. Um, I just want to open the floor. So um, anyone have anything they want to start with? I know I'm excited for dam removal that's gonna happen. Um, you know, crossing our fingers that it all works uh, like we think it's going to work and that mother nature uh, cooperates with the right weather and flows. Um, but uh, I just want this to be, you know, the opportunity to talk about what, what do we need to do? What's, what's coming up next? What's anything that you wanna talk about? Um, yes, Rick. Is Keto Dam next on the list? Well, you do work for the Bureau of Reclamation, so <laughs> I'm going to ask a question. Um, someone for the Bureau is Kino Reservoir next? Yeah, uh, Reclamation is taking ownership of that. If if there is a spot in the Klamath Basin that has the worst water quality, it's Kino. Um, yeah, well, I think we're moving the dam right. Not necessarily improve it too much, or based on the way things have operated historically, the fact that there's a basalt, you know, I call it a dike myself, but they call it a reef. Yep. Yep. So and at, with the Kino and Townley becoming the compliance point now, so, so my response is, is to think more about how to introduce flexibilities in the Kino endowment versus like rebuilding what nature has there. So how I know that there's a lot of limitations, but how do we fluctuate the endowment, uh, you know, to allow that disturbance? How do we do that? Uh, increase water current capacity? I'm staying on reconnecting the floodplain as a means to do that and address water quality. So there seems to be a lot of limitations to the thought process about how to overcome the challenges associated with moving and applying. I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of continuing with Kino, is there any progress on the fish ladder and its functionality at Kino? You know, I'm not up to date too much, so I must go on that. Those discussions that I have been pretty easy. I was I was there this morning and it it looked like it water was flowing through it unobstructed. Yeah, I, you know I think the dam uh, the ladder that exists right now is probably still functioning. Yeah, it's just for sure. Yeah, I. Yeah. As a representative of BOR, are you suggesting that people outside BOR BOR need to start advocating for the removal of? You know, Rick. <laughs> uh, I'm not advocating for I'm retired here. Dam <laughs> modifications might be something good there. Yes. One one last thought in California. I'm just getting my back. Um, for. Uh, we just had a collaboration meeting with the state water resources control board, regional water quality control board. DWR is going to host 20 years of temperature and dissolved oxygen data on our water data library provided by uh, the regional water quality control board. So we're trying to make the best use of our resources and share platforms. It's a lot of data. So. For the Scott and Jasper. It's just those specifically? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it accepting any data from outside entities? Uh, we're just going to start with this um, first big measure test. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, that would be the continuous probes or the grab samples. Yeah, they're, or, uh, they're continuous. We have a lot right. more in the Shasta, or they have a lot more in the Shasta. Yeah. Than we've got, but uh, yeah, it's just Scott. Yeah. yeah. So right. we're working to to host it online. Water data library. We'll be in touch. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this room can, you know, speak to that. You know, there's, uh, you know, federal and state databases where, uh, you know, nutrient data, you know, grab sample data, discrete data can go um, and then be in this public platform. Um, but there's not the same, you know, uh, functional databases often for continuous data, uh, whether that's water temperature data or data from SANS, um, you know, so that's just one of these gaps that I think we collectively have. Um, you know, Eli works with a ton of temperature data. Um, I know you, you know, keep it kind of in your own platform, um, but, you know, it's not like a public version. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of work, obviously, USGS over the years, um, you know, hosts their continuous data on, you know, their platforms. And uh, both the Yurok and Karuk tribes have been hosting their continuous data via Aquarius, and that's just such a great resource, not only to have that real-time data, but go back in time and see what, uh, you know, what conditions were. So, you know, advancing that capacity to host, you know, this historic water temperature data, I think would be a great, a great thing to have. And maybe it starts with DWR getting their internal data in. Um, Eli, how much temperature data do you have? How many? Uh, How many billion data points? 50 million records, maybe. 50 million, uh, like, individual, like... Yeah, out, 15 or out in that. Okay, okay. Some, I mean, that's just a guess. That's less than I thought. Yeah. It's just a guess. Yeah. Um, I have a comment or question. Yeah. Uh, just to encourage people, if you have some uh, water quality data or a flow gauge that somebody else is collecting, uh, there's kind of a lot of flux right now with the, the dam removal and Pacific Corps leaving the basin. They've been funding some gauges and funding some sampling. So if you have some data that you rely on, just find out who's been paying for that and if it's going away, if you need to do something about it. Um, there have, you know, there will be a continuation of some of that uh, data collection that Pacific Corps was funding. Um, yeah. And Caitlin talked about that today but you know it's it's not as complete as the pacific core data collection was um just because it wasn't required um through the dam removal compliance um you know but there will be gaps i think especially upstream um uh you know microcystin has been something that's been collected throughout the climate basin you know um and it's been a a, a great data set but what's going to happen, you know, post dam removal for that microsystem data collection at, past the compliance period. Um, you know, I don't think we have answers to that yet. Uh, so collectively, you know, we should be having those conversations about, you know, who can collect the sample, how does it get funded? Um, because those are, you know, that leads to public health concerns um, and postings, uh, you know, microsystem toxins are, um, you know, just one of the cyanotoxins that can be a problem. So um, continuing to you know, continuing that monitoring is going to be important, but how do we do it? Um, anyone on Zoom is welcome to, to chime in as well. Um, I'm trying not to drive this too much. I want it to come from the group. Liam. Just, just wanted to remind folks about this um, grant opportunity to hear recognition for aerial snowpack information data acquisition. Um, that's a really special interest in that. I'm happy to help um, shepherd that through since I've already worked in work with ASO. Do a lot of those same contracts. So um, I have been told that you know, any kind of cash helps, but also having a lot of stakeholders involved in it. So it would be nice to get this group work together and about that as well. So I can hear from you, but does that mean like grants for drones? No, it's really it's it's, it's 
the last time they did this was a couple of years ago. It's it's specific to um, airborne snow operations. Very uh, narrow technology. There's really only one company can do. They're former NASA scientists that broke off. And so it's satellite. It's it's airborne, so it's it's deployed on initially aircraft, and it's combination of LIDAR, photodynamic free sputter, and they're all EO and um, they're the only game in You've got a grand opportunity as sports one private company making a bunch of money. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> you gotta hand it to them the opportunity there. And they're very active in the Sierra and have contracts with the uh, state of California to be based throughout the snow. Simulation period to get very accurate with off estimates. Um, using it in this space is a more pilot scale effort. Being funded. So, um, is, is it basin wide or just the upper basin that you're interested yeah, in? Yeah, right now it's just like, you know, we're only dealing with 1,400 square kilometers with a commonly slow port in the top of the boundary of the PRR wilderness. So they can, they can do it. I mean, that's one of those deals like. Have the money, they've got the capacity, they can do the whole basin. I just don't know if that's necessary. So, a lot of money. Yeah. That's not good. Speaking of remote sensing, uh, Dr. Sujin Lee from OIT here, who helped host, he's actually gone at this point, but um, he had mentioned to me, you know, about the, uh, the drone work that he's. You know, trying to expand. Um, the university has a, a lidar drone and an, an infrared drone as well. So, if you know that type of data could be valuable for any of your projects, I think he's looking for ways to collaborate. Um, so, you know, again, this is going to be much better spatial resolution than you can get from a satellite. Exactly. Hey. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to leave, but you know what? If you need to have those kind of data set, please let me know. I'm gonna find a way to cooperate, uh, collaborate with you, okay? Great. All right, thank you. Thanks, you, Jim. Just to piggyback off that, I'm not sure if a former student of Sujin, but uh, Will Natividad, the director of the Soil and Water Conservation District, he told me he has a lot of, I think, connection with OIT to use their drones, but um, he has a lot of clearances through um, Clearances and the experience to do a lot of monitoring with drones very affordably in the basin. So, okay. Um, yeah. All yeah. Partnerships. Um, in yeah. The conservation district. I, I personally, I'm really curious where that will go in the next five or 10 years. Um, you know, the ability to expand monitoring mm -hmm. efforts uh, in a, you know, perhaps more cost effective way, um, you know, and to be able to repeat monitoring. Um, you know, over the years that can, you know, track the same exact flight path and be able to really, you know, measure change over time. That's what he stressed to me that it was cost effective. I didn't get all the details, but it had something to do with the partnership with all IT. So. Yep. Great. Well, um, opportunities there. Um, you know, monitoring is going to change before we all retire and, you know, where, where will it go? You know, we'll find out later. Um, but, you know, finding new innovative ways to monitor. Maybe it's difficult at the beginning, um, you know, to find the right techniques and the right equipment, the right approach. But, you know, there's probably, uh, there's probably some great opportunities there as well. Um, any other threads to follow? Any good KBOM talks that we didn't get to that are prime for a future meeting? Think about there's the are you familiar with the Klamath Meadow Restoration Partnership? Let's Quite. think about them for future, like what's going on with meadow restoration and yep. water storage. You mean go upslope? Yes. Yes, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, uh, any okay. other good ideas or I thoughts for future? Been, I don't. I for, I'm forgetting now who is doing the research, but I think there's been several efforts to do like geochemistry, if that's the right word, on different spring. Uh, systems to look at the sort of the flow paths from different elevations of the mountains, and um, <clears throat> I don't know if those are ready to go yet. Or do you know, Megan? Here, um, USGS gave us a preliminary peek at it 
gosh, maybe a year or a year and a half ago. Um, I don't think that's been published yet, but um, yeah, there is someone in my office that works quite a bit on groundwater and knows those folks. But I agree, the results are very interesting. I can't remember all of them now, <laughs> um, but I think that would be great for a yeah. I think there's some from like around the Shasta River also. I think it's not just upper yeah, basin, right? The ones I saw were just the upper basin, but yeah. I'm sure they're different. Does that mean for I'm not sure. It was too long ago and yeah, I haven't read them before. All of the thoughts on that one upper basin mm -hmm. will all uh, Yes. So, and that is, and I actually didn't mention that one, but that's another important thing. Yeah, that sounds like the one. Yeah. I don't want to speak out of turn, but. I'm pretty sure that there's some LIDAR mapping happening um, on the Scott River as well. Um, maybe that is included in some of the mapping that there's, we're mentioning from over by Shasta and stuff, but uh, they're using that data to plan out and, um, and decide where to drill some monitoring wells to monitor the groundwater levels and stuff like that. Um, and the cabin meadows and rock vents creek areas, which are eventually tributaries into the Scott River. Um, and I, I only know that because I observed it on a meadows tour. I, I haven't worked on it myself, but they were like talking about LIDAR and stuff. Like, How did you get that? <laughs> and they were looking at like an, an interactive map and stuff on their on their tablets to try to um, pinpoint and to, to plan where to put these monitoring walls. So that's the only little bit that I've seen of it over in our neck of the woods. I know we're not the only meeting going on today, which just shows you how, you know, how much is going on in the basin. Um, it, you know, down in Shasta Scott, there's a drought regulation workshop that's happening. Um, in another part of Oregon is a big three-day conference on the state of the beaver. So, you know, there is so much happening here. It's really impossible to keep track of it all. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, there's just perk a plenty. Um, and so I hope, you know, Something like KBUM is helpful for you in terms of you know providing good information that's useful. Um, you know we hope you are able to give back by providing you know updates or presentations or data reports to help you know share that because it's a it's not just us talking to you. We want to hear from you as well. Um, so you know if there aren't other conversations to have, I, I do want to let us get on our way. Um, there is you know, a, a reception tonight um, at the Common Block Brewery, a newer new brewery, as I mentioned earlier. Um, love to continue the conversations. Um, hope, I'm hoping you're saving the good ones for there. Um, but, uh, you know, I really appreciate everyone being able to come and take the time to, you know, to, to come and listen and learn and contribute. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you know, we'll look forward to the next KBUMP meeting coming up in the spring, um, date and location to be determined. But, um, you know, there are opportunities to, uh, you know, we usually like to be in different parts of the basin, kind of alternate a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if the next one will be in Wairika or the lower basin or maybe back up here. We'll have to see what, what's happening. Um, Liam. I think we, we owe you some gratitude yes. for keeping the KBUMP oh. port burning. For all these years, so. Thank you. Uh, Clayton's not here anymore, so you took that. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, I love my job, and I'm lucky to have it, and um, it, it's just great to be able to kind of help bring this all together. So uh, I, I feel blessed to, to be where I am, uh, but thank you. Um, all right. Well, everyone. <laughs>